In this video, I'm going to talk about how fluid accumulates in the COVID lung. So this is a paper that was published recently in 2020, and um, I'm showing this paper because it gives you a little bit of anatomy that's really, really important. It also describes the nature of the fluid accumulation. So in this paper, so CT stands for CAT scan. So CAT scan images revealed that there are characteristic white patches called ground glass containing fluid in the lungs. So when people die, they will do autopsies and they find that this fluid is like a clear liquid type of jelly. You can see what it says, much resembling the lungs of wet drowning. So we're talking about fluid accumulation. So where is it accumulating? Well, this is an image from Wikipedia, very nicely done. And you can see here is here are the lungs. Now at these little terminals, like right here, this little box, these little terminals, what we have here are the functional units of the lungs. So this is called uh, alveolar sacs right here. And these individual uh, alve alveoli here are made up of lung cells. These lung cells are called pneumocytes. So we're going to look at this a little more closely because this is where the buildup occurs, right in here of the fluid. And then so what's supposed to happen here is you breathe air in, so you breathe in oxygen and you ex exhale carbon dioxide. When there's fluid in these cells, that transfer does not occur. And that's where you get your respiratory failure. Okay, so this is from that same paper. You can see this is an individual alveolus. So what you see here is a pneumocyte, another pneumocyte. And you can see these pneumocytes, lung cells, make up the alveolus which is called an air sac. So this is where the air is. And here they're showing immune cells as well. So down below, what you can see is a alveolar capillary. And so this is where oxygen and carbon dioxide get exchanged back and forth. Now notice this would be, you can see here, early stage where the, where the lung cells look normal, the pneumocytes look normal. And here is a fluid-filled pneumocyte. That is the problem. So I'm going to show you how this works. And to do this, you got to, you got to go through some, some basic chemistry stuff. And uh, I'm going to show you how this ACE2 enzyme operates. So this is a video I did back on June 1st that shows how uh, the ACE2 receptor is really an enzyme. And this is how the coronavirus enters our cells. So if you want, you can watch that in more detail. I'm going to show you a couple images that I created for that video here but the much more details will be in this video because I don't want to spend a whole lot of time going over this again. So this is the enzyme, ACE2. Here is your lung cell, also called a pneumocyte. So this is the lung cell membrane. And so you see this is outside the cell, this is the cell membrane, this is inside the cell. So the function that has been known for a long time, uh, at least in terms of, of ACE2, is that it converts pro-inflammatory angiotensin II into anti-inflammatory angiotensin one seven. So pro-inflammatory becomes anti-inflammatory. Very straightforward. Now the other thing about this enzyme, this is where the novel coronavirus called SARS-CoV-2 enters lung cells. So very important to understand this because, well, we're going to show you what happens when somebody is non-inflamed, you know, non-flamer, they're deflamed. So here would be a, a deflamed person with normal glucose levels. They get mild entry of the virus into lung cells. And as you know, many, many people have virtually no symptoms. So then what is the difference between someone who has normal glucose versus a high glucose person, a metabolic syndrome person, or a type 2 diabetic person, pre -di or a pre-diabetic, which is kind of metabolic syndrome-like. So this is the difference. You can see all the G's. The G's stands for glucose. Glycosylation means glucosing of proteins. So when you have hyperglycemia, now who would that person be? Well, here is your obese person pounding these calories. And obese people like this almost always have high glucose levels. And this is why they are at much greater risk for suffering side effects from the novel coronavirus, because you get a much greater entry of the virus into lung cells. 
Okay, so with that in mind, we're going to look a little bit more at the, the enzyme ACE2 because the ACE2 enzyme is the key for understanding, or part of the key for understanding how fluid accumulates in a COVID lump. So this is showing us, again, you can see angiotensin II, pro-inflammatory. If you have adequate ACE2, the enzyme, you convert angiotensin II into angiotensin 1-7, so we have a balanced production of the two, and now we have inflammation reduction, lung damage reduction, so no, so we have a balance. Very, very different for obese hyperglycemic people, and the reason why is because obese people pump out way more angiotensin 2, and people who are hyperglycemic, vitamin D deficient, and omega-3 deficient, and when they're infected with SARS-CoV-2, there is substantial inhibition of the ACE2 enzyme. So here's what it looks like. This image comes is right in the, my new book, The Deflame Diet for Immune Health. What I'm going to show you in the remainder of this in terms of fluid accumulation is not in the book because I learned it after the book was published. Maybe in a rewrite, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll add it. So obese people who are hyperglycemic make more angiotensin II. So hyperglycemia, vitamin D deficiency, omega-3 deficiency, reduces ACE2. So you can see ACE2 small here, ACE2 big here. The SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus, it also inhibits the ACE2 enzyme, which sets up the stage where you have too much lung damaging angiotensin 2 and not enough lung protecting angiotensin 1-7. So that's part of the story. We're going to do a little more on how ACE2 works now. So as I showed you before, the image I just showed you previously, angiotensin 2, pro-inflammatory, is converted into angiotensin 1, anti-inflammatory, and then we have a deflamed lung state. And we also have normal blood pressure because angiotensin 2 is the, 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 the molecule, the protein that stimulates uh, higher blood pressure. Okay, so with this in mind, what else does ACE2 do? Very important for fluid accumulation in the lungs. There is a substance called DA bradykinin. This is its acronym. So DABK, pro inflammatory. Proper ACE2 levels allow for the conversion or the inhibition of inactivation of DABK. So we want to be able to inhibit pro-inflammatory DABK inactivated. If not, we will end up with fluid accumulation in the lung. So this is a paper that shows this very, very nicely, and I highlight it right here. You can see a decreased activity or reduced expression of the ACE2 enzyme by the coronavirus impairs the inactivation of DABK which is very important because DABK is the driver of, is the driver of uh, fluid accumulation in the lung. So I'll show you how this works right now. So here is the lung again, the distal portion, these little spots here, you can see they're showing this spot is this, and you got your alve alveoli here. There's a whole bunch of sacs of these alveoli. See how small this is? This is, this is the outcropping. And you can see these little blue and white, uh, blue and red capillaries. That's where air exchange takes place, which does not occur if there's fluid buildup. So we're going to use this image here. I'm going to use you explain it in simple language without going through all the details here. So this is from that paper. Now this is the only, well, not confusing, but you just got to just realize this is a receptor. So BKB1R is bradykinin B1 receptor. It is the receptor for pro-inflammatory DA bradykinin. So what do we know about this receptor? Well, first of all, when you see permeability, that means increased fluid accumulation. So here's what you need to know about BKB1R. It is rarely expressed at baseline, but it is highly inducible by inflammation. Well, if you're hyperglycemic and obese, you are inflamed, and so at much greater risk for inducing the expression of BKB1R. So you can see, in particular, the bradykinin receptor shown to be involved in pathogenesis of inflammatory diseases. So let us look at how this works. So here we have the BKB1R receptor. Once activated by DABK, DA, 
DA bradykinin. DA bradykinin binds to its receptor on the lung cell, and that will lead to increased fluid accumulation. Now, remember that it is DA bradykinin that is degraded by the ACE2 enzyme. The same way angiotensin 2 is converted to anti inflammatory angiotensin 1 7 by the same ACE2 enzyme. So, this enzyme, ACE2, is inhibited by hyperglycemia, vitamin D deficiency, omega-3 deficiency, and the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And that is how we end up with an excess of DA bradykinin that will bind to, again, binds to its receptor to cause fluid accumulation, which then inhibits the ability for, for one to breathe properly and breathe in oxygen and breathe out CO2, which is why they move towards respiratory failure. Okay, so do a little review here. So remember, SARS-CoV-2 enters normal, non-high blood glucose people at a mild degree to the point where there can be zero symptoms compared to hyperglycemic people where the ACE2 enzyme is glucose-laden or glycosylated, which gives us much more viral entry. All this is discussed in my new book. In the new book, I also go over these details, and I discuss these details in that previous video that I showed earlier in this presentation. So we know that the ACE2 enzyme that degrades bradykinin and also degrades angiotensin II is reduced in people who are hyperglycemic, vitamin D deficient, omega-3 deficient, and infected by SARS-CoV-2. Big problem. Here is the image again we can see. The ACE2 enzyme, which is called angiotensin converting enzyme 2, is inhibited by hyperglycemia, vitamin D deficiency, omega-3 deficiency, and the SARS-CoV-2 novel coronavirus, so that causes inhibition of ACE2, and this means that DA bradykinin will not be degraded, and this will allow DA bradykinin to bind to its receptor on the pneumocytes that make up the alveoli, and that allows for increased fluid accumulation, and then the uh, that jelly-like appearance on autopsy, and that and that white appearance on 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 CAT scans. So. Pretty straightforward. There are probably other mechanisms, but this is the one that is being described now uh, in, in the literature to a decent degree. So if you uh, like this video and you want to learn more about the D-Flame stuff, if you haven't already, you want to pick up the new book. This is my author page on Amazon. And there's one more thing that you should know about obesity when it comes to this, because obviously obesity drives uh, is typically associated with hyperglycemia, so that's going to drive up angiotensin 2, reduce angiotensin 1, 7, and the bradykinin issue. There's another issue that's just not being properly characterized when it comes to obesity. Obese people who uh, are characterized as being at greater risk for uh, developing a bad case of COVID-19, but it's deeper than that, and this is very, very important, and this should motivate people to hopefully... Uh, get rid of some body fat and normalize their glucose levels. So COVID-19 is not a virus, a mask, or a lack of a vaccine crisis. It's actually an obesity hyperglycemia crisis, as I describe in this book. So what do we know about obese people? Well, if you, if you have, have you ever heard the term vector? Vector is the, is, is the way a, an infection is transmitted. So when it comes to the plague, for example, we used to think it was rats, it's now known to be fleas. Fleas are the vector of the, of, of the plague. Well, when it comes to uh, viral infections, obese people are the primary vectors. So it's not just they're more disposed, they are the primary transmitters of viral infections. So what should you know? One, obese people are more prone to infections. This is bacterial and viral. Obese people shed more viruses. Obese people create more viral mutations with increased virulence. You've, everyone has heard about, oh, the virus is mutating, much more likely to occur in the obese body that's hyperinflammatory because of the immune dysregulation that occurs compared to a lean, healthy person. Obese people stay infected longer, so they are more contagious. Now, if you've ever noticed, 
when people move from normal weight to overweight to obese, at some point they start to breathe more heavily. So obese people breathing more heavily and more frequently, they expire more viruses. So they breathe out more viruses. And then finally, vaccines are less effective uh, for obese people. All the citations are in this book, and here is one of them. Due to prolonged viral shedding, quarantine in obese subjects should be should likely be longer than normal weight individuals. So in this COVID era, people should reorient their thinking as to the nature of obesity. The obese population is not just more likely to have a bad case of COVID-19. They are the primary vectors of COVID-19. This should be made well known, and this should motivate obese people to get their body weight down to a level where they are no longer, where their CRP levels are no longer elevated and their blood glucose levels normalize. If you want more information in general about the Dflame approach, you can go right to the dflame.com website and you can click through and score volumes for each of these books or individuals, which typically go right through Amazon.